Uh, we're here with uh, Judge Mary Lou Kill. She is running for the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, place two. And uh, we've discussed with her, I'm John Wirtz, and with me is Bob Bagley, and we've talked about kind of the uh, little housekeeping rules of up to five minute opening, and then we'll do up to 45 minutes of Q&A uh, with two minute responses, um, and then up to five minutes closing. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you for your opening. All right. Thanks for coming. Mary Lou for Place 2, Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, it's our state's highest criminal court. The bulk of its cases are felonies. It also hears um, death penalty cases. And all it does is criminal cases on appeal. No civil cases, no drug court, nothing like that. It's a specialized court, and it calls for specialized judges. And I'm offering... Um, 30 years worth of criminal trial and appellate experience that's directly relevant to the work of the Court of Criminal Appeals. I'm opposed in the primary by two men, both of them from Collin County, and they are offering so much less that's relevant to the work of the court that I'm better qualified, not only than either of them, I'm better qualified actually than both of them put together. And that's why I have on my website a series of charts that show my experience compared to them and I brought one of those charts printed out for you um, because before I was a judge, I was a um, prosecutor for Harris County. And for four and a half years, I did nothing but criminal cases on appeal. And I have, to my credit, 279 criminal cases where I represented the state. Judge Wheelis, rival number one in my charts, has had six criminal cases on appeal. And Judge Oldner, rival number two, has had eight. I've been a felony trial court judge for 21 years. My court, the 232nd in Harris County, is dedicated by statute to criminal cases. Judge Wheelis has had felony jurisdiction for seven years, and his court hears civil and family in addition to criminal. Oldner has had 13 years in the district court, and he also hears civil and family. So there are seven years and 13 years, or even less than they would appear. As a prosecutor and as a trial court judge, I've handled <coughs> 10 different death penalty cases. I represented the state on five death penalty cases on appeal when I was a prosecutor. And then as a judge, I presided over the trial of five death penalty cases. Each of those cases was affirmed on appeal by the Court of Criminal Appeals. And then I handled uh, at least one writ per case after that. Three of those cases still have writs pending, and two of those defendants have been executed. I mentioned death penalty because um, those are the most serious cases that the Court of Criminal Appeals handles, and as long as we have people on death row, the court's going to be handling those cases, even though we try fewer of them now than we used to. Um, and it seems strange to me that we would have anybody nominated as a candidate for that court who has little or no death penalty experience. Judge Wheelis and Judge Oldner, as far as my research can determine, have no death penalty litigation experience, not at any stage not in any capacity. And um, if they do have that kind of experience, they don't mention it on their websites. And at a campaign forum this past weekend, I challenged Judge Wheelis to explain whether he has ever handled a death penalty case, and he did not answer that question. I'm board certified in criminal law and have been for 25 years. Judge Wheelis is board certified in personal injury and civil trial law. Those areas have nothing to do with the work of the Court of Criminal Appeals. When I first got into this race, I thought that the main issue was going to be experience, and I feel like I'm far more experienced in areas that are relevant to the work of the court than is Judge Wheelis or than is Judge Oldner. But I've come to realize that there is an additional issue, and that is philosophy. Judge Wheelis has been reversed on appeal 13 different times in criminal cases. He's been reversed as many times as I have been, and I've been a judge for longer than he has been, and I've only handed, handled criminal cases. The extraordinary thing about his reversal record is that he's been reversed on appeal by the state 13 times. And you have to understand that the state has a very limited right to appeal in criminal cases, and it has to exercise its right to appeal very judiciously because they have to pick their battles. They don't have unlimited resources. Unlike the defense, who is given the right to appeal and, and given a free lawyer and can appeal everything that he wants to, the state does not have that opportunity. 
But over and over again, Judge Wheelis has, has thrown out the state's case on suppression grounds, thrown out the defendant's confession, um, dismissed cases for speedy trial, collateral estoppel, double jeopardy. In those cases, have gotten appealed and reversed by the Court of Appeals. Now, when I first saw his record, I thought, well, you know, he, everybody makes mistakes. He just doesn't know, he doesn't understand the law. But this weekend, when I saw him speak at the Cypress Tea Party event, he said some very interesting things. One of them was, I'm a different kind of judge. I'm a contrarian. Um, Texas, uh, the Fourth Amendment has been trampled by Texas courts and the U.S. Supreme Court. I am the kind of person who wants to do something about that. It's clear that he has an agenda. He's not just making mistakes when he's making these rulings. He is doing it purposely. He has an agenda to change the law. He does not like the law as it is. And as a trial court judge, he apparently feels entitled to rule the way that he thinks the law should be, not the way that the law actually is. Now, he claims to be a conservative, but that is not a conservative philosophy. That's a lawless philosophy. That's a radical philosophy. That's a, I am the dictator of this court and I get to do what I want kind of philosophy. For me, a trial court judge is supposed to follow the law and rule in accordance with the law based on the evidence in front of him. Not just do what he feels like doing and what he thinks the law should be. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the, um, How many are on the uh, Criminal Court of Appeals? No. Or, sorry, Court of, court of Criminal Appeals. <laughs> you better get that right, huh? <laughs> it does sound funny to say the Criminal Court of Appeals. Yeah. Uh, that's what my mom tells it to me. Uh, nine. There are nine, nine judges on that court. They dispose of thousands of cases every year, and it's uh, you can't afford to have a clunker of a judge on the court. And as I said, it is specialized, and the, you know the whole point of having a specialized court is undermined if you put generalist judges on it. The judges need to be specialized to take advantage of that specialization. And the specialization comes from the Texas Constitution. And so unless we amend the Constitution and decide that we want to have a generalist court, which Judge Wheelis thinks we should have, it's not going to change. So um, if we're going to fulfill the goal and the mission and the structure that's given to us by our Constitution, I think we need to have specialist judges on that court. In your questionnaire, um, and, and I know where I'm going with this, but you're not. Um, we talked about the, um, uh, where was it? Budget, uh, number nine. What are the top three areas the budget mm -hmm. for this office needs to be adjusted? Mm -hmm. And you said you didn't know. Is it because it's so hard to get the information? Um, I have never concerned myself with that. Okay. I don't even concern myself with my budget in my own court. You know, I've been a judge for 21 years in Harris County, and that is just not something I deal with. It's administrative. We have an administrative office that deals with it. And we also have an administrative judge who probably is very familiar with it. But I've never um, involved myself in those issues. I'm really just involved in being a judge, and I am day in and day out working uh, in the courtroom. So not like here, you don't have to worry about your budget with them your office or infrastructure for, for anything. Yeah. And where I was going with that is we're, we're all about transparency and it's really hard to find out where the money is going for state offices mm -hmm. as well as, as county offices. So we're trying to get it so that, that more and more judges and everybody else, every other elected official has their spending record out there so that people can actually see where the money is going. Um, that was So, um, the <clears throat> you made a comment in your opening, and then also on number four, and describing what you believe are the most significant issues in the race and why. You indicated that your main rival, um, Judge Wayless, Wayless is uh, disagrees with existing law and has been reversed on appeal. Mm -hmm. so you, 
is that's kind of a broad statement. Is it disagree with all of it or just parts of it? Is you know, it mainly tied to the Fourth Amendment because um, that's well, most of his reversals have been on suppression issues, yes, where he's okay. thrown out the state's evidence and the Court of Appeals has said, No, you didn't legitimately do that, that was wrong. Um, but it's not limited to the Fourth Amendment, although that's what he commented on just the other day. He's also thrown out cases for um, speedy trial grounds, double jeopardy, collateral estoppel. He's thrown out um, non-custodial non statements as if they were subject to Miranda when they're not. Uh, the state, in one instance, didn't have the opportunity to appeal that. That was in a sexual assault of a child case or an indecency with a child case. And um, it Is seems that, that comes to? Vardaman, yes. Okay. It seems that he, whenever he has the opportunity, he will rule against the state on things, even when the law does not support the ruling. And that's why this is a pattern. I mean, every trial court judge gets reversed. That's not, that's not to say that judges don't, I've been reversed. Everybody gets reversed. But when you have a pattern like this over and over and over where he keeps throwing out the evidence illegitimately, that's a pattern. And then you couple it with his statement about uh, the Fourth Amendment has been trampled by the courts in Texas and the U.S. Supreme Court. So I'm the kind of person that has the philosophy that we need to do something about what's happened to our country. He wants to impose his own eccentric view of the law on everybody. He wants to take this show statewide. He's already done it to Collin County, causing one injustice after another. Uh, and now he wants to do it everywhere in Texas. Okay, so we've got no time left, but I'll come back to that. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Um, okay. I'll just do another two minutes. Um, when you look at the endorsements on here, and we know we don't know everybody on here, uh, a lot of the statewide folks uh, on, on you know the handout, which is public and what's on his website, um, there are a lot of people that we know. Um, that are very high profile yes. statewide. Yes. And also, there's a lot of people within Collin County, you know, on this website, you mm -hmm. know, that are supporting. Mm -hmm. and so, if he's doing that many things wrong, and, and I don't want to just tie it just to him, but mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you kind of made the issue, you, mm -hmm. you know, that he's the primary contender here. Yes. Um, how can you reconcile that if he's got so much support within Collin County? Um, is, is, you know, is he that bad? Uh, or is he as good as he says, you know, to these folks? Yeah, does that make sense? Yes, that okay. does make sense. I understand your question. Um, yes, he's got a very impressive list of endorsers. The thing is, those people don't probably vet him at all. He's been a political um, mover and shaker, a political insider for a long time. He's an activist in the Republican Party up there in Collin County. More power to him. That's great. He got appointed to both of his benches. He's never, you know, sought office uh, as a judge by running for office. He got appointed. He's the ultimate political insider. As somebody told me the other day, I've been working and he's been networking. That's what he's been doing all these years. Yes, he's very politically connected. And of course, people like him. He's a very personable, um, charming, nice uh, kind of person. He makes people laugh. Uh, they enjoy hearing him speak. He's a uh, good one-on-one. -on -one. But he's just not qualified to take on this job. And he does have a very abysmal record as a trial court judge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, there, there were a couple of them, and I, and I just, I just blew my thought now. Um, I, I liked your answer on the on twelve. Talk should the state license barbers, lawyers? Um, we've. Gotten into a situation where the state feels like they have to have a part of everything, right. and they have to have some of it's the 
the taxes that they're getting off of the license, and mm -hmm. so it's an income uh, revenue source for them. Mm -hmm. um, do you, with the barbers, they regulate their own. Basically, they have to they go to barber college and you mm -hmm. know they get their certification mm -hmm. from them. The lawyers have law school; they come out with their degrees. Um, is it really good for the state to sit in there instead of the bar association to to regulate or give licenses to lawyers? I mean, there's good and there's bad. Oh, am lawyers. I advocating? In other words, right. in the state? No, right? No. Um, no. Because we have we have a barber. You're right. gonna get your hair cut. And mm -hmm. You may not like it, but mm -hmm. it's gonna grow back. Right. You can have a good lawyer, or you can have a bad lawyer, and you lose your case and go to jail where you shouldn't have. Right. Um, but I, you're. Your comment was that that yes, that um, the state should license lawyers. So I'm just trying to find out exactly what you meant by no, that. No, I just meant that if you're going to license somebody, it makes more sense to license somebody that is doing something that is of serious consequence potentially. Okay. And the licensing of barbers is really not a consequential, important, you know, big high risk thing. Right. What if they put if they're using chemicals in your hair? Well, you know. Yes, you can get into all of that, but you know, the thing about regulation and um, barbers, did y'all did y'all follow that case in the Texas Supreme Court about the threaders that came out this year? Yes. The uh, Institute yes. for Justice pursued that. I was really delighted with that ruling. This has nothing to do with the Court of Criminal Appeals, but if I were a civil practitioner, I'd want to work for the Institute for Justice. I really admire the work that they do, and I and I um, can appreciate people just wanting to make a living, do a simple service, and having to get a license for it and go through all that ridiculous training that has nothing to do with what they're doing. Um, it's not just burdensome in and of itself; it's anti-competitive, mm -hmm. and a lot of these regulations and licensing schemes are supported by the already established providers of those services so that they can manage the competition right. and not have to um, you know let everybody in who wants to do it right. um, so yes I didn't read the question that way I just thought you were asking about regulation in general but yeah, was, no I'm not saying the bar should be replaced by the state okay. no no <laughs> I, I think it's better when they regulate their own and they I they, think that's probably true and you know in this day and age of so much information available the marketplace is so much more transparent than it used to be so you don't have to just subject yourself to some crummy person if if you want to research you can right. so all right um, how long do you plan on serving and um, Second part of that question is, do you believe in term limits? I um, am taking this one step at a time, and I just need to get through the primary first. <laughs> and then if I'm lucky enough to, to be elected, then um, I can't tell you how long I would serve. I, I know it would be at least one term. Um, beyond that, I'm not willing to speculate. Do I believe in term limits? I um, don't advocate for term limits for judges. I do not oppose them, and I can even lean in favor of them for legislative races. And that's just because of my observation over the years that um, legislators seem to lose sight of their mission once they've been in office for too long. And I think that they um, just are looking at their next campaign instead of trying to advocate for what's best for their constituents and, and the nation in general or the state in general, depending on the office they hold. And, um, you know, judges are actually doing a job, and it's a, it's a special kind of a job, and it's not just, you know, legislators have to grandstand so much, and they raise all that money, and, and people want to influence them, and especially criminal court judges, there's not a lot of money in the campaigns, and there's nobody trying to influence us. You've got people who are charged with crimes, you've got people who are victims of crimes, and it's about as pure a practice of law as there is. Mm -hmm. okay. um, all right. And how long is the term again? Six. Six, Six years. years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
On 15, it was talking about what carries the greatest influence under Rowling's case law, the Constitution or other. You said it depends on the issue. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to ask that question a little more, give me a little more insight to that, but also your feelings about um, ruling from the bench and basically making case law or law from the bench. Okay. Well, the um, you know, I'm a trial court judge, and so I'm on the lowest part of the totem pole in terms of, you know, just making law. I don't really make law. I don't see that as my job. In fact, I see that not my job. That is contrary to my approach. I believe that I have to follow the law, whether its source is the Constitution, statute, or case law from higher courts. And this is another distinction between me and Judge Wheelis. He didn't seem to feel that way. But the reason I said it depends on the case is because I make so many different kinds of decisions every day. And some decisions are governed by statute, pretty clear cut and dried sort of thing. Some are governed by case law. Some, um, the case law is derived from the Constitution. You rarely really go just to the Constitution because there's going to be case law interpreting it. Um, but then a lot of times I do have discretion. I have discretion to rule on the things in front of me. And um, it's not that I'm making law, it's that I'm making judgment calls in particular situations. So I can't single anything out and say I would rely more on this or more on that. It just depends, it really depends entirely on the situation. Discretionary situations are usually like sentencing. Uh, the defendant has been found guilty and he's going to the court for punishment or he's pled guilty. And you just have a range of punishment and first degree felony, five to nine even on your life. And so, you know, you're just looking at the situation and making literally a judgment call. There's not precedent or statute or something telling you give him X. You just have a range that you have to choose from. So I'm going to take personal privilege on this one and finish on, go, go through some more on that one. Okay. Um, with doing the, um, your sentencing, mm -hmm. two of my favorite judges are uh, Judge John Devine, state Supreme Court judge, and Ted Poe. And both of them went outside the box when they did sentencing. I loved it. I, it was very appropriate, I believe, in the old days um, when I was a kid. You went to the judge, you screwed up, and you had a choice. You were going to jail or you are going in the military. We don't do that anymore, um, unfortunately, for some kids. Um, but, and not that it happened to me, but, <laughs> but um, I have, I, I, I like that idea of, of going outside the box and doing sentencing. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's your sentence to work with, um, with somebody, um, for, for conditions some of probation, it, it's, right? Exactly. Creative conditions of probation, sure. Right. sure. And, um, and then I've got, and I bring this up almost all the time, but we had a, a young teenager, 17 years old, ran a red light, not drinking, not driving, you know, not drinking and driving, not texting, just ran the red light, wasn't mm -hmm. paying attention, and ran a red light and killed three people. Mm -hmm. um, there, um, there's crosses. We're at the intersection um, here in Conroe where um, those three people died. And he's responsible, I believe, for 20 years to make sure that that property is kept um, manicured. Mm -hmm. There's no weeds, the, you know, the grass is mowed, and everything is kept clean and proper. It's, um, he did do some jail time, but this is, a, this is something that is going to remind him every time he goes out there, every time he sees it every time he drives past it, what he did, and the consequences that he had for his, his action. And I think sometimes, and I want your feelings on it, but I think sometimes we, we give a sentence and they feel that's it, it's, it's over and, mm -hmm. and I'm dead, and mm -hmm. there's, there's no, while there's remorse, there's still no ongoing memories mm -hmm. of what takes place. And if he doesn't continue to man, to, um, to, to take care of it, then he's going mm -hmm. back to jail. Mm -hmm. So there's consequences, again, for, for his actions. So, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any feelings for those? You know, um, the one instance that comes to mind where I did something similar to that was, um, I had a sentencing hearing coming up in an intoxication manslaughter case. Intoxication manslaughter and intoxication assault. 
the defendant had several prior DWI convictions. And um, what happened was a man and his son were running an errand, like a Saturday afternoon, no big deal. And this very drunk defendant came along and forced them off of a bridge. The car flipped over. The um, boy was thrown clear but broke his uh, spine. The dad was drowned. Um, so when that case came up, I knew that the boy was going to come testify in the punishment hearing. And he wanted the court to assess a stiff punishment. So I had my probation officer um, contact people that were on probation for DWI or intoxication, whatever, in our court. And they could get community service credit if they came and watched the sentencing hearing. And I had about, I don't know, 10 of them come in and watch. This kid came in, not just in a wheelchair, but in a special kind of wheelchair where he was lying back. He had trouble breathing. He could not do much of anything at all. And when we administered the oath to him so that he could testify, the bailiff had to lift his hand for him. I almost lost it. And uh, those guys who were on probation, they were paying attention. And uh, so I sentenced the defendant to life. Uh, he deserved every single minute of it. And then at the end, I called those guys up. And I knew that one of them had been driving without permission. And uh, so I said, all right, which one of you is, you know, Joe Blow? Me. I said, you've been driving when you're not supposed to, haven't you? And he was taken aback. I said, you're going to jail. And so they took him away. And then the others, I said, you better follow your conditions of probation. If this doesn't teach you the seriousness of your behavior and why it is you're on probation and how it is that this court's going to enforce the conditions, then nothing will. And you can just go to jail right now. And, you know, it was a dramatic moment and kind of a rare one for me. I could never compete with Judge Poe on all of that sentencing stuff. He was really great at it. Um, I, and I, I don't have his charisma, but that was a good moment for me, and it was very useful. And I think it was instructive for those guys that came in on sure probation. Was. Thank you. Um, a lot of these questions, as you can tell, may not be specifically geared towards this court. I mean, we're, um, we're, we're not attorneys. Um, you know, this is... Probably That's okay. Is, this is, yeah, this is, this is probably human. That's probably good. Yeah, I can drill a well. You can do something useful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, what you do is very useful too, as well. And that's that's keeping us safe. So, um, let's see. So I got I have a question. I guess probably as much based on where you are now. Um, do, do you think general jurisdiction uh, courts are better um, or specialized courts within a particular region? Well, uh, what do you think is more effective? You know, I am from Harris County and we have specialized courts and that's what I'm accustomed to. And as complicated as the law has grown, especially on the civil side, I think that it does make sense to have specialized courts. And I really appreciate the fact that we have specialized um, courts at the top. The Court of Criminal Appeals and the Texas Supreme Court, one civil, one's criminal, they're equal, and um, they're very specialized. And I, th I think that that is advantageous for obvious reasons. Um, I would not advocate for generalized courts at the top of our judicial pyramid, mm -hmm. nor do I advocate for it at the bottom. I know that there are a lot of counties that have, you know, non-specialized courts, and I think that's fine, but um, when you have high volumes of certain types of cases, uh, I think you're better off if you can specialize your courts. And in the bigger counties, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. I just pushed the button and lost all my questions. Let's see. <laughs> I'm going back. Sorry. I've got a couple half of the camera that's off to ask here. Let's see. Okay. Um, to what extent, okay, the question 14, to what extent do you believe the state or federal government should be able to obtain court orders directing parents to do things for their children that the parent um, 
does not believe should be done. Uh, and you answer when the health of the child is in danger. Um, who determines that? Well, that would have to be a court case. I don't see any other way for it to be determined. Mm -hmm. You'd have to have judicial intervention. Okay. Um, the question right after that is, um, 15, question 15, what carries the greatest influence on your ruling, case law, constitution, or other? And you said it depends on the issue. Can you mm -hmm. give examples of each, please? Sure. When I'm setting bond, uh, I look at the statute. There's a statute that says you take into consideration uh, what he's charged with, what's the range of punishment, what are his ties to the community, what's his prior criminal history, what's um, in the best interest of public safety, that kind of thing. And so that gives you what you have to consider when you set bonds. So that's a statutory thing. Uh, the admissibility of a confession, that's both statutory and case law and constitution. Uh, you have to look at all those sources of law. Um, what punishment, uh, what's the range of punishment in a case? That's statutory. So those are examples. Um, would you, so we're still short of a minute. Have you ever seen any law in, in your 30 years of practice that you feel is unconstitutional and you would like to take it on? Um, certainly there are other judges out there that do that, but mm -hmm. have you ever felt that this is so bad? Because you made a comment um, about the ruling on gay marriage. Uh, Sentimental class Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. I was looking for that. I, like I laughed on that response. I like that I phrase. Yeah. yeah, yeah That's an inspired moment. Yeah, on, on what Kennedy uh, did on that. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, obviously, you didn't agree with that. No, I didn't agree with that. And uh, maybe Obamacare. Uh, if, if right, I, I disagree with that. that. Sure, so. sure, I did disagree with that. Well, um, are you talking in the criminal law context? Well, just in general, like I said, not everything's going to pertain to the criminal aspect of it. I, you right. know, the, the only thing I've seen so far is, is the clerk in Kentucky, Kim Davis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, where the judge threw her in jail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, was, did that fit the uh, crime? Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that Threaders case that I mentioned before, I, I thought that that regulatory scheme was unconstitutional, and I appreciated the Supreme Court's ruling on that. Um, I won't say that this is unconstitutional, but one time I had a Texas Ranger come into my office with a warrant, and he conducted this undercover investigation with several other officers, and he was very excited. He wanted me to sign this warrant. And it had to do with their investigation into an unlicensed racetrack negligently allowing betting at, on their premises. Okay, so this man has set up a racetrack. They've got photo finish stuff. 